Welcome. Welcome to tonight's closing keynote with John Bewin. We um, just experienced something pretty amazing, I think. Um, I was frantically running to and fro, but I caught glimpses of some of the magic that I was hoping would happen here uh, in the conversations, in the panels, and the talks. Um, it is really incredible uh, that you all came together, shared your knowledge, and um, are celebrating our little art form. Um, I wanted to give a few pieces of information about tonight before I introduce our speaker. Um, so tonight's keynote and reception is sponsored by Himalaya. Um, Himalaya is the number one podcast platform in China. Um, they have an astonishing 470 million installations on people's devices. Um, and they have five million creators, people who create content um, and shows for their platform. Um, their stated goal is to, quote, spread knowledge via audio, to foster learning, and inspire conversations that matter. Um, which is why it made sense for them to be a partner with us here at Sound Education. They're also interested in, in partners um, and creators um, among us, actually. There's a lot of demand for really good English um, content um, over in China. And so um, if any of you are interested in finding a new market um, and finding new audience uh, for audiences for your shows, um, they're interested in talking with you. Um, so that's MLA, they're, they're wandering around tonight. You can, you can talk to them. Um, Ariel Liu is their COO who joined us this week. Um, so our reception following this, convert, uh, this uh, speech, this talk, will be in the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. There's a set of stairs that we can take from in here. So I know it's hard to find this place. They'll still get lost, but you'll be in the same, the right building. Um, and you will go up some stairs, and we're going to be in a room full of Mesoamerica um, and uh, Day of the Dead altars. So be careful with those altars. Um, they're temporary and a little fragile. Um, we'll also be um, serenaded by the incredible Erica Mancini uh, on the accordion. So um, really excited. She's a, she's a very close friend. She drove up from New York uh, just to be with us tonight. Um, so John Bewin is the audio program director um, at Duke University, uh, the Center for the Documentary Studies, and the um, host of the Center's audio documentary podcast, Seen on Radio. During his 30-year career as a public radio journalist and documentary maker, he has told stories from 40 American states and from Europe, Japan, and India. He grew up in Mankato, 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 Minnesota, studied philosophy at Gustavus Adolphus College. <laughs> he began his radio career as a 22-year-old reporter at Minnesota Public Radio, reported on the Rocky Mountain West, my hometown, from NPR, for NPR, and spent eight years producing long-form documentaries for American Radio Works. Um, he came to Duke in 2001 um, in a residence kind of role, and uh, then became the full-time audio director in 2006, he even taught the uh, Ministry of Ideas senior uh, producer, Nick, uh, Nick Anderson. So he, we have alumni of uh, John's really a wonderful teaching career uh, with us. Um, he has produced programs for All Things Considered, Weekend Edition, This American Life, and Studio 360 on the BBC, lots of specials on stations nationwide, um, and in recent years has been particularly from his bio, quote, animated by curiosity about the human experience, a love of radio craft, and an interest in social justice. So we're really honored to have John here tonight. Um, he embodies everything that we are trying to cultivate and nurture um, with this conference. Um, so please join me in giving him a round of applause. Thank you, Zach, so much. Uh, good to see you all. Um, this is a little bit of a low-tech thing, so I'm going to be like holding the microphone up to my laptop speaker when I play audio. So just in case anything goes awry, you'll do, like remind me I need to do that. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I don't know about you, you all, but actually I flinched a little bit when I saw on the schedule 
uh, Listen to Black Women by John Bewing. Um, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> having a white dude deliver a talk with that title could be wildly inappropriate or <clears throat> maybe just a useful thing for our times. Obviously, I'm in the latter camp because here I am. Um, so, you know, people who who've been listening to Scene on Radio for the last couple of years. Uh, we have one, we have one. You know that I've really set out in a pretty transparent way to uh, explore first whiteness uh, in our previous season, seeing white, and then patriarchy, misogyny, sexism, as a straight, white, cisgender, uh, non-disabled male. I've said up front in both cases that because I'm that guy, the colonizer, the oppressor, um, I'm suspect actually as someone trying to see and to explain white supremacy and patriarchy in a society that's almost ingeniously designed and organized to keep people like me in denial about how it all works. So on one hand, I've needed to rely heavily on the best scholars working in these fields, most of them not white men, and it was essential also that I have a close collaborator slash co-host uh, for each project to bring a different perspective and to keep me honest. Um, so in the Seeing White series, most of the episodes including a, uh, included a conversation with Chenderai Komunika, the African-American media scholar, activist, and podcaster, podcaster who teaches at Rutgers. And this season for our men uh, series, distributed by our friends at PRX, by the way, that will plug in. My co-host for the season is Celeste Headley, longtime public radio journalist and host, and, and a woman who, by the way, identifies as black and mixed race. So in the episode that I'm about to more or less deliver, um, Celeste plays an important role, as she does throughout the men's series. Um, she's not here, obviously, but uh, she'll be here briefly on tape. I'm gonna play a couple bits of our conversations. So all of that is about you know, sort of overcoming my limitations as a white guy doing this kind of work, this kind of inquiry. At the same time, part of my premise uh, in taking on these projects is that it shouldn't just be up to black people and other people of color to fight racism or to tell the truth about it, uh, and likewise with women and sexism. White supremacy is a white people problem. Uh, sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, that's a dude problem, primarily. Duh. <laughs> but I, I say primarily um, because we explore in the men's series how patriarchy and the tendency to prop it up infects people of all genders in varying degrees. Just think Sarah Sanders, for instance. So um, enough with the disclaimers. This talk is based on part four of our current season, the men's series. Uh, it's an episode called Feminism in Black and White on the podcast. It would also fit right in as it happens, uh, say, as the 15th episode in our previous series, Seeing White. Well, children, where there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. <laughs> but what's all this here talking about? So a lot of us have heard some version of this from Sojourner Truth. It's billed as a speech she gave at a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851 to a room full of white women. In this recording, Alice Walker, the novelist, is reading a popular rendering of the speech at a public event some years ago. I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Sojourner Truth was born into slavery in New York, not the South. She was freed in 1827 when slavery was outlawed in New York State. 
and became a traveling minister and abolitionist. Named simply Isabella, as an enslaved person, she renamed herself Sojourner Truth in 1843. She had five children, not 13, and she lost one son when he was sold to another slave owner. And ain't I a woman? That famous refrain, ain't I a woman, it turns out Sojourner Truth may or may not have said those words. The historian Nell Irvin Painter uh, wrote a biography of Truth years ago. In doing her research, Painter found an account of the speech published right afterwards in an anti-slavery newspaper that just doesn't include Ain't I a Woman. That recurring phrase was included in a version of the speech published years later by a radical feminist, a white woman, who did attend the speech, though. So it's unclear. But there's a reason that phrase has resonated with so many for so for, for more than 150 years. No matter who wrote them, those four words get to the heart of intersectionality, a good century before that term was coined. With the phrase, ain't I a woman, Sojourner Truth seems to be saying to white feminists, hey, you're overlooking me, a complaint that resonates this day with a lot of women of color. In other ways, though, the two versions of the speech are consistent. Sojourner Truth apparently did say something like this, for example. Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with them. <laughs> There's lots of applause. What is, you know, what is clear from the speech is that Sojourner Truth was an abolitionist and a feminist. Um, now, I'll speak for myself. When I'm reminded of moments like this, this woman that I think of as an iconic black abolitionist speaking at a women's rights convention, it brings just a touch of surprise. The, it makes me do a little double take. Almost like somebody's taken two separate stories and mashed them together. Or when you read that Frederick Douglass, also of course a, a major black abolitionist who escaped from slavery, and a man even, that he attended the very first women's rights convention ever held in the U.S. at Seneca Falls in 1848. Douglass helped to push for a resolution there calling for women's suffrage. What are these major figures from one social justice tradition, anti-racism, doing over here in this other one? The fight for women's rights. Now of course that's clueless. Um, as my co-host Celeste Headley put it, why is it surprising that, that people like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, who knew better than anyone what it meant to have someone else claim ownership over their bodies, would care about the rights of black people and the rights of women? In my defense, <laughs> that's how those histories are presented to us, right? If you get your history from American schools, and major media, maybe documentaries, you'll get the idea that the fights against sexism and white supremacy are pretty much separate matters. Over on one side, the feminist movements, led by people like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton back in the 1800s, when women were fighting for the right to vote. In the women's lib movement of the 1960s and 70s, it's Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem and so on. Feminism is its own thing and usually presented as a story about mostly white men. And then separately, the fights against white supremacy. In the black freedom struggles, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth in the 19th century, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X in the 20th. Here's Celeste Headley. That's exactly how we're taught the history, and honestly, it kind of makes me angry, because I grew up in a very different reality. My Jewish grandmother married my black grandfather in the 1930s, when it was illegal for black and white people to get married in California. So they went to Mexico to get married, and that same grandmother was enough of a feminist that she kept her own name when they got married in 1939. And, and I gotta say, for her and for some of the black women that I grew up around in my family, these things were not separate. Anti-Semitism 
white supremacy, misogyny, they were all about the abuse of power against the minority. To her and to me, her Jewish black female grandchild. Oppression was oppression and you fought all of it. And yet, as I grew up and left home, I had to learn in, in very personal and sometimes painful ways how determined people are to separate these issues and, and draw distinctions between people. I wasn't accepted among a lot of African Americans because of the lightness of my skin. And I've been asked to speak about feminism or about racism, but never about them together, as though there are these two different problems instead of just two different flavors of the same awful dish. I talked to Glenda Gilmore about this chronic failure to see the connections and intersections between racism and sexism. She's an historian who just retired after a couple of decades at Yale. I write about race and gender, generally in the South, but sometimes uh, nationally and internationally. I ask Gilmore what we miss when we present feminist movements as separate from other struggles for social justice, especially fights for racism. I believe we're missing the entire story as it was lived by the people in both movements in any time and any place. The intersections of what happened with race and gender constantly come up from the abolitionist movement of the first part of the 19th century through the last election, really. The truth is, Feminist and anti-racist movements have inspired and instructed each other. They've collaborated, they've competed, they've often pissed each other off. They're entangled in many ways. And not just the movements, but the oppressions themselves. Sexism and racism, economic inequality for that matter, they're all deeply entwined, overlapping, overlapping and intersecting. To take one rather obvious and important example, white feminist women, are white. There's also the fact that racism in our culture is heavily coded with notions of sex and gender, which we'll say more about in a, in a bit. So even though we try to peel these things apart, in the real world you just can't. Before we go further, um, I'd like to acknowledge that in this little journey we're not going to examine how intersectionality plays out with every racial and ethnic group. These dynamics apply in roughly similar ways to Latinos and Asians and Native Americans. Various racial and ethnic groups considered neither black nor white. But the invention of whiteness and blackness was the original sin, the sin that set the framework for the exclusion and exploitation of all sorts of people who are deemed non-white. And to be honest, things are complex enough when you're trying to make sense of intersectionality. So to keep it somewhat more manageable, I'm going to focus for now on black anti-racist movements and feminism. So as I just said, Frederick Douglass was at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848, where a couple hundred attendees drafted a Declaration of Sentiments modeled on the Declaration of Independence but demanding rights for women. At that point, Douglass and women's leaders like Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton we're all ostensibly working for both equal rights for women and the abolition of slavery. Some years later, in 1866, right after the Civil War and emancipation, Douglas would join with those women and Susan B. Anthony and some other people to found the American Equal Rights Association. Its stated mission was, quote, to secure equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage irrespective of race, color, or sex. The coalition was soon deeply divided and the group disbanded within three years. Here's Glenda Gilmore. The problem with solidarity is often that one cause will win out over another when the power structure ultimately comes down on movement. What happened to abolitionists who became women suffragists is that they had to choose. The power structure controlled by white men pushed back hard against those fighting either racism or sexism and made it even more daunting to contemplate fighting both at the same time. 
as far as race, especially uh, especially when it came to race, the late 1860s were a real pivot point in U.S. history. The Union has just defeated the Confederacy, and the country's leaders are debating what historians now call the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution. The 13th and 14th, outlawing slavery and guaranteeing equal protection of the laws. And then the 15th Amendment, giving formerly enslaved men, not women, the right to vote. That last one drove a wedge between abolitionists and women suffragists. Glenda Gilmore says the white women leading the suffrage movement were not happy. The bargain they wanted to make was that women got the right to vote, and then perhaps freedmen and freed women got the right to vote. But when they had to choose, they knew that they couldn't promote their own cause if they were going to be accused of promoting African-American welfare over white women's welfare. And so they, they literally bailed on uh, African-American suffrage. Most of the white women suffragists did. There were some who never did. Some of those people were in the Society of Friends, were Quakers. Some of them were sort of outliers in the women's suffrage movement. And obviously, there were many black women who came to espouse both of those goals, votes for women and votes for freed African Americans, after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. On the flip side, there were squabbles in the abolitionist movement. The men who wanted to give women a voice in that movement got severe pushback from other men. One of Glenda Gilmore's books is called Gender and Jim Crow, Women and the Politics of White Supremacy in North Carolina, 1896-1920. Throughout the book, she shows how white supremacy sits on a foundation of patriarchy. Take the shocking story of Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898. What was called a fusion government, progressive and pro-reconstruction, has just been elected uh, in Wilmington, it's the largest city in the state at the time. The government is made up of white and black Republicans and members of the Populist Party. Men from the party that lost the election, white Democrats, decide they're not happy. Uh, two days after the election, white men, town leaders stage a coup and take over the government, take over the town government. Kill probably 150 African Americans in the streets and run um, most black prominent leaders out of town. Many leave never to come back. So it's a bloody uh, massacre. They had ordered a Gatling gun, a repeating gun, which is like a Gatling gun, mounted it on the back of a truck and shot people. It's the only successful coup in U.S. history. It put a bloody end to Reconstruction in North Carolina and ushered in one party, white supremacist rule for generations to come. It sounds like a story about racism, plain and simple, but Gilmore says white Democrats justified what they did with a propaganda campaign, a familiar racist lie drenched in patriarchy. The idea that men are not being manly by protecting their families, or that giving even an inch is going to cause an eruption of black men pursuing white women, it's the oldest joke in the book. And we see it really across the world, in many places, with many races, people in power who demonize people of other races often do it by talking about them being a threat to your daughters, being rapists, being violent. So a generation after the end of slavery and reconstruction, black men's citizenship rights are pretty much completely shut down in the South. White supremacy reigns across the country, excluding black people from political and economic power and threatening black lives with a new wave, wave of lynchings. Meanwhile, women still have few rights, of course, including the right to vote. So at the turn of the 20th century, black people and women of every color still have gigantic struggles on their hands. Of course, there's one demographic that falls into both categories, 
the fights to make life better for black people and for women literally come together in the bodies and the lives of black women. And so we went, 3,500 people was in that hall. And so when Garvey came, we applauded very much. This is the voice of Audley Moore, often called Queen Mother, in a 1985 interview. She's talking about a visit to New Orleans uh, in the 1920s by Marcus Garvey, the black nationalist leader who was inspiring millions of black Americans with his calls for pan-African movement and economic empowerment. Moore recalls that the white mayor of the city had blocked Garvey from speaking the night before, so Garvey rescheduled the event. This time, those in the audience came prepared to back him. And we all was armed. Everybody had bags of ammunition, too. So when Garvey came in, we applauded him. And the police were lined man to man along the line of each bench. So Mr. Garvey said, my friends, I want to apologize for not speaking to you last night. But the reason I didn't was because the mayor of the city of New Orleans permitted himself to act as a steward for the police department to prevent me from speaking. And the police jumped up and said, I'll run you in. When he did this, everybody jumped up on the benches and pulled out their guns and just held the guns up in the air and said, speak, Garvey, speak. And Garvey said, as I was saying, and he went on and repeated what he had said before when the police filed out the tall, like little puppy dogs with their tails behind them. Uh, so that was radical enough. I had two guns with me, one in my bosom and one in my pocket, real very special. She was a really incredible woman. She was born, we think, in 1898, around that time, and she lived until 1997. And during that time, she was at the forefront of pretty much every major moment in organization of the radical black freedom struggle. Historian Ashley Farmer, until recently at Boston University, she's now at the University of Texas. She's written about Audley Moore, among other radical black feminists of the 20th century. Dr. Farmer says Moore, who was born in Louisiana, who was an organizer with the Communist Party in New York in the 1920s and 30s. By the 1950s, Moore had moved back to Louisiana and founded the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women, the UAEW. This group of women, they're kind of middle-aged to older black women, come together um, and um, try to fight for kind of the civil rights of black people in New Orleans, both men and women. And while they are doing this work, they kind of start to say, you know, somebody should really be paying for all of this injustice. Um, and I think from there they get the idea that some kind of redress or some kind of reparation is needed. Audley Moore was a pioneer in calling for reparations for slavery. She delivered a petition on the subject to the United Nations in 1959. Also in the 1950s, Moore and her group campaigned two black men in Louisiana, Edgar Labatt and Clifton Porritt, who've been accused of raping a white woman. It was very clear from um, the moment that they were arrested that um, both had alibis and did not know this woman and had no probable cause to be anywhere near this. It even came out the fact that she had lied, as often was the case when white women found themselves in positions they didn't want to be known as being in. In other words, when their consensual relationships with the black man had been discovered. The kind of go-to excuse was to blame a black man for rape um, in order to keep one's respectability and kind of womanhood intact. Barbara says Audley Moore and her group went to work. Labatt and Port were both working class or poor, you know, black men, so they didn't have great representation and people to go dig up um, information. It seems that under um, the leadership of Moore, the women in the UAW were able to identify, um, for example, um, Labatt's girlfriend and you know, help get an alibi for him and um, raise other key inconsistencies in the prosecution's case against the two men. They literally would take this information and take it down to the courthouse in support of these men. They got several stays of executions. These men were both on death row. Um, and they were eventually both released, although it would take another 10 years to do so. This is one of the cases that 
the UAAW, the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women, and Ali Moore took up to try to not only exonerate these men, but also um, to kind of shine a light on the fact that black men were either being jailed or lynched for the you know supposed rape of white women that wasn't true. The false rape, rape accusation of those two black men is a familiar story. It highlights one of the more bitter points of tension between black and white women in America who might otherwise have interests in common. On one hand, the perennial racist canard about the black male rapist threatening white women, and on the other, a brutal 400-year history of real sexual violence that a lot of white folks would rather not talk about. Historian Glenda Gilmore. There wasn't a problem with black men raping white women. Those occurrences, if they happened at all, were extremely rare, but it was fairly common for white men to rape black women in the South and to have common law families. So the hypocrisy of uh, that equation has always been there. Of course, some black men do commit rape, like men of all races and ethnicities, but most often against black women. Gilmore's point is that the threat posed by black men to white women was vastly exaggerated for generations to justify excluding and controlling all black people. So for African-American women, activism has often meant defending black men against rape allegations and speaking up about rapes committed by white men. Okay. Come on now. One morning last April, I met up with Sandra Harrington in Montgomery, Alabama. She was taking her two grandsons, Marquez and Prince, to school. Marquez is 14, Prince is seven, she dropped them off, Marquez at his all-boys private school, and Prince at George Washington Carver Elementary. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. You can't go far in Montgomery without passing a site or a sign referring to Alabama's history of slavery, Jim Crow, and movements for black freedom. There's a street named for the president of the Confederacy. We just crossed West Jeff Davis Avenue. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And signs marking where Martin Luther King Jr. led thousands of marchers on the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. It was in Montgomery in 1955 that Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus. But the story I've come to hear from Sandra Arrington is one that far fewer people have heard. It happened six years before the Montgomery bus boycott. So when they picked up here, I thought she was headed east, and this is going east toward In a quiet working class neighborhood on the west side of town, Sandra tells me what happened to her mother, Gertrude Perkins. It was well before Sandra was born, late one night in March 1949. Gertrude Perkins was 25 at the time. And they were walking home, so at one point, Bernice, her, her friend was named Bernice. She went a different way to go home, and my mom was headed home too, and that's when they found her walking. And made her get in the car with them. They were two police officers in a squad car, white men. They, I guess, saw her walking and told her that she was drunk, uh, get in the car, they was going to take her to jail for being drunk. Um, and once they put her in the car with them, um, they took her down this street right here, which is Oak Street, and took her down there. And at the end of the, the alley is uh, where the train tracks were, and that's where they raped her at. And once they raped her, they put her back in the car and took her back to the corner of Day Street in Davidson and put her out. It might have ended there, another act of racist sexual violence suffered in silence. But Sandra Arrington says her mother's parents, especially Gertrude's father, had raised Gertrude to fear no one. She went straight to the nearby home of the black pastor, Solomon Say. And when they put her out, she came to my door. And she told me what 
had gotten to her. This is uh, Reverend Say in an interview recorded in the 1980s by Emory University. I sat down and wrote what she said had happened to her, word by word. And when she had finished, I had it notarized and sent it to Drew Pearson in Washington. And Drew Pearson went to, to the air with it. Drew Pearson was a liberal white newspaper columnist and popular radio host. And when the power truck you knew uh, anything here in Montgomery, what Gertrude Perkins said happened to her was all over the nation. Gertrude Perkins and Reverend Say also went to the Montgomery police that night. Sandra Arrington says the black community rallied around her mother. It was a big story because it ran in the newspapers from the point from the choose break, March 27th. So just about every week up until May, they ran articles in both the black and white newspapers. And it was like just a big old racial thing with the whole entire city. The rape allegation led to a rare grand jury hearing, but the case never went to trial. <clears throat> the city government even managed to protect the two police officers from ever being named publicly. So it seemed that was that, and for a long time, the case of Gertrude Perkins really didn't figure in the rich, controlled history of Montgomery. But 50 years later, in the late 1990s, historian Danielle McGuire was listening to her public radio station. It was a program about the civil rights movement, uh, an oral history of veterans from the movement talking about their experiences. And this particular episode was on Montgomery. And Joe Asbell, the city editor of the Montgomery Advertiser, which was like the white newspaper, um, was talking about the bus boycott. The historic bus, bu uh, bus boycott of 1955-56. And he said something that totally caught my attention. He said, Gertrude Perkins is never mentioned in the history books, but she has as much to do with the bus boycott. As Gertrude Perkins is not even mentioned in the history books, but she had as much to do with the bus boycott and its creation as anyone on earth. And it stopped me in my tracks because it was the opposite of everything I thought I knew about the Montgomery bus boycott. I thought, well, that's silly. You know, it's Rosa Parks. Everyone knows it's Rosa Parks. And so I was really curious um, about Gertrude Perkins. So I went looking for her story in the Montgomery Advertiser um, in the microfilm, and I found her in 1949. Danielle McGuire tells Gertrude Perkins' story in her book published in 2010 at the dark end of the street, black women, rape, and resistance. Along with the stories of other black women whose sexual assaults helped to spark the civil rights, uh, spark civil rights activism across the South and beyond in the 1950s and 60s. McGuire says it took her a while, but she came to understand why Joe Asbell put so much importance on the case. The Perkins case helped to mobilize the black community. It was divided in many ways by class issues, and it brought everyone together, and it brought everyone together around the protection of black women's bodily integrity. And there were other cases that um, continued to pile up in Montgomery during those years um, that were particularly about black women's right to their own bodies and their right to move freely through the world and those cases centered on police violence that was also sexualized, and it centered on violence on the buses. Um, once I put all those pieces together, Joe Asbell's comments made perfect sense. McGuire says the organizing that happened around the Perkins case laid the groundwork for what happened uh, for that moment six years later. Rosa Parks, uh, an experienced activist and, and a rape investigator for the NAACP, along with other black women in Montgomery, <clears throat> excuse me, had had enough. They were tired not just of being forced to the back of the bus, as the story is usually told, but of being physically and sometimes sexually assaulted by white men on buses, often drivers and police officers who leered at them, flashed them, sometimes beat them if they showed even a hint of resistance to the humiliations of Jim Crow. Most of these women were working class. They worked as domestics. 
in white homes and they needed transportation across town every single day. And so they had no choice but to get on those buses. For most of those black women, um, the buses were really the bane of their existence. McGuire says when the bus boycott broke out in December 1955, black men in the community got behind it and in front of it. The young Martin Luther King Jr. was recruited as the main spokesman, along with other male pastors and local leaders who became the public face of the movement. But behind the scenes, in the everyday, uh, what Ella Baker would call the spade work of the movement, it's women. Women led the boycott, they were the ones who walked, they filled the pews at every mass meeting, they raised all the local money to sustain the movement, they ran the carpool system. Um, you know, without women, there would be no Montgomery bus boycott. And without the movement being about women's issues, there would be no boycott. So I like to think of the bus boycott really as a women's movement for bodily integrity and a women's movement for dignity. Danielle McGuire's book makes clear that this Montgomery story is not unusual. Obviously, the other things that we always hear about as drivers of the civil rights movement were real and important. The separate and unequal schools, the indignities of separate restrooms and water fountains, lynchings and other violence against black men, and of course the whole systemic exclusion of black people from all but the most menial jobs and from political power. But McGuire's point is that this factor has been seriously underestimated in explaining the whole civil rights movement. Sexual violence against black women and an urgent desire among black women themselves, above all, to do something about it. Okay, not tape at that point. In my conversation with Celeste Headley toward the end of the episode, we talk about intersectionality and how the word is showing up more often these days, but how it's sometimes misused, especially by white folks, who often use the word simply to refer to diversity within social justice movements. So for example, having some people of color involved in the women's march. When what it actually means is doing the kind of work Audley Moore did, tackling sexual violence and racism and economic inequality, uh, and much, it means much more than that. Here's a couple minutes of that exchange with Celeste. But behind the scenes, and that takes us back to Kimberly Crenshaw and what she was trying to describe when she first used the word intersectionality. Her insight was that black women being marginalized by both racism and sexism are not just doubly oppressed, affected by sexism in one moment and racism in another. The effects are compounded, layered on top of each other, injustice squared is how she puts it. I would really encourage people to read some Kimberly Crenshaw or at least watch her TED talk. Um, Celeste, do you have any other last thoughts on all this based on your own experiences of what it's like to be a woman and not white in this society? You know, I wrote an essay in 2015 and I was trying to describe my identity as a mixed race woman. And I mentioned that my great-great-grandmother, um, who was a slave on a plantation in Milledgeville, Georgia, had six children by several different white men. I wrote that none of those relationships were consensual. But a reader commented that I couldn't possibly know whether she was raped or not. She lost five of her six children to slavery. She was raped multiple times. And when the Civil War ended, she was the single mother of a mixed race child. That's my history. So when you talk about compounding oppression, that's the family story that was passed on to her daughter and her daughter's son and eventually to me. And so I see media coverage of black women calling them angry or unfeminine or what Gwen Ifill called missing white woman syndrome with all the headlines about white women who disappear and almost none about violence against black women. And that feels not like a current injury but like a pain that goes back to that wooden shack on a plantation near Atlanta. It is compounded, at least for me. We go on to, uh, to talk about the 2016 election and the persistent tendency of many white women to choose the privilege of whiteness over solidarity with women of color 
and if white women feel attacked, I mean, white men are hopeless, right? So, so no offense. Um, and we talk about the, uh, the philosophy of standpoint theory, which basically says that um, people on the receiving end or at the bottom of oppressive social systems, uh, hierarchical systems, are just going to see the world more accurately than the people who benefit from those systems. And we talked about how that could help explain the yawning gaps and how people voted in 2016 depending on their race and gender. 62% of people who look like me voted to put uh, a racist and sexist in the Oval Office, as did 53% of white women famously while 69% of Latino women, 82% of black men, and 94% of black women voted against that guy and for the first female major party nominee. Perhaps because maybe, do you think, black women just see the truth of our society more reliably because of their position in it. So in other words, folks, listen to black women. Um, and it's not enough to just listen. It never was enough, uh, and it's certainly not now. We need to act, too. Thanks. I think we have a few minutes for the folks that have Unfortunately, we're a small operation. It's pretty much me uh, conceiving and researching and reporting and actually you know, largely writing and producing and mixing and the whole thing, although obviously Celeste, that we didn't hear much of it, but there's probably 10 or 15 minutes of, of, of the two of us talking kind of at, at near the beginning and at the end. Um, and that's a collaborative process that we kind of work out together, kind of the meets that we're going to hit, and, and she participates in that. And then we have um, uh, PRX, uh, John Barth and PRX kind of looks over the script too, just kind of to make sure we're not screwing up too bad. But that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, I would like to have more of a, a larger staff, but it's, Uh, we have, well, let's see, for the month of October, we just hit 200,000 downloads for the first time. Um, so, do you have any ideas? I don't. We okay. don't have that. Uh, yeah, I'd love it. I mean, judging from what I see on uh, just sort of who follows us on social media and um, it seems like pretty even. I mean, there's, um, there's a whole lot of white people. There's a whole lot of people of color. A lot of women. A lot of men. I, I just would. I don't see any particular skew. Now, this kind of work. There's a sense in which 
I, I hate to even say the most important audience, but you know that that you know it's sort of like some people of color say, white people get get your people, you know, and I feel like I, you know that that I'm kind of trying to do that, but but we have lots of lots of people of color who listen to the show and. I think, like what I say about the Seeing White series, for example, which is, you know, this deep dive into race and sort of literally like how, who invented whiteness and why and how that all, literally how it went down. Um, and and it, it also makes a very forceful argument that, that race is uh, probably bigger and deeper and worse than you think. Right, no matter, almost no matter who you are, especially if you're white. Right, so I, I always feel like people of color know that they know that part, um, but they, but they, uh, people of color learn a lot because none of us really get a very good education about all of how it all happened, right? How we got this world that we're living in now. So, yeah. So, talking about the genesis of these these ideas objects. What, like, how, what's your planning like, what's your process like, what's the timeline like? Yeah, do people, hear, like, the, do people hear the question? Can't hear the question. The question was like, what with with these, so Seeing White was 14 part series, roughly seven hours total. This one's gonna be 12 parts, the men series. Um, and he asked, uh, what's the, 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 yeah, the genesis and the kind of planning and preparation process. So, um, so basically what I've done as a result of, uh, of these projects, actually, I've kind of the shape of this show has evolved to where this is what I'm doing now, at least for the time being, which is these kind of focused seasons or series, and then I go away for months and months and work on the next one and come out with the next one. So um, with Seeing White, I, I think I decided roughly around the time of the Republican convention <laughs> in the summer of 2016, uh, when Trump was nominated. I think that was kind of the last draw. I'd been thinking about a series on whiteness, and I decided then that I was gonna do it even not thinking that he was actually gonna be elected or that it was unlikely. Um, so then from like late summer, yeah, and we started rolling that series out in February, and that was too soon, honestly. I should have banked more episodes. Uh, because it was a, just a headlong race from then on, trying to get one out every two weeks because they weren't made. You know, some of the interviews were done, most of the interviews were done, but the pieces weren't made at all. And with this, with so then that was that series wrapped up in August, I think, of 2017, and this one didn't even start until June, late June, beginning of July, actually. So that's like 10 months. Where I, now some of that, actually several months of that, were sort of the aftermath of seeing White and doing some talks. Um, my partner Chen Jirai and I went around and did some talks. We made a radio special. We did some other things that took some time. But it was probably six months of close to full-time um, research and planning and thinking about how it was then starting to do the interviews for the men series. Does that answer the question more or less? Yeah. Oh, you want to follow up? I guess, yes. Like, I mean, yeah. what have you learned doing so many of these? Like, what have you learned now, looking back at the show? You mean about the work or about the process? Yeah. What, what have I learned that I wish I'd known earlier? Well, I do wish that I'd uh, banked more episodes before I started rolling out. <laughs> That's for sure. Next time, man, I'm having at least a half dozen, half the series in the can before I. Um, like produce. Um, aside from that, I don't know. I feel like I've I've learned a lot. I feel like I I probably, and part of this is just having been doing this now for it's frightening to say it, but well over 30 years. That there's a um, even though I'm talking about all those months of work, that I actually don't feel like there's a whole lot of wasted motion at this at this point. But it's an incredible amount of work. You all know, and then the editing process. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah. Oh yeah. So in both seeing white and then you tackle some like really big issues that could be super toxic. How do you break them down? Yeah, good question. How do you break it down with these big, huge issues? How do you kind of break it down into manageable 
Yeah, obviously with something like that, and there were a few people when we were in the middle of the Seeing White season who said, be and just change the name of the show to Seeing White and just keep doing that, right? which you could easily do. And you could do, a, you could do a show on patriarchy and sexism that just goes on forever. It's, so you, it's sort of a matter of deciding, you know, are there, are there really a pretty small number of um, things that seem really essential to say that people generally, that most of us don't really get that we need to get, and then how can you show those things, right? How can you kind of teach those things? I'd say it's pretty didactic stuff. And, and in each case, there were several episodes that were really kind of pure history. This was, this was part four. Uh, a couple of the ones before this, like part one asks basically, when was patriarchy invented? Right, and what's the best scholarship say about that? It's not the cavemen. It's, it's 10 or 12,000 years ago, which is only about 5% of human history. Um, and it was, most scholars think it pretty much happened when people started to settle out of hunter-gatherer societies into and doing agriculture and kind of settling into bigger, more organized societies that started to have this specialization and that men sort of <coughs> seized, what did, what did this one guy call it, anthropologist, a, a, a patriarchal conspiracy to basically seize power. Anyway, so there's that one, and then there's one that sort of asks, how did we get through the Enlightenment without, with patriarchy intact? How did that go down? So, so there was those, that kind of stuff. And then it's just a matter of, it's, it's more ad hoc than you might think about deciding what is, well, then what's another half dozen or so episodes that are just going to be interesting and say something worthwhile. Let's do one final question on Max. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I want to ask about the final point you made about moving from listening to action yeah. and listening not being enough. Um, because I think you know, those of us who do shows like this are worried about that kind of bait and switch that happens whereby listening becomes the action that people like, think that they're doing. Yeah. So, you know, like, like I know when I interview working class folks, that I am offering them up to a kind of like a, a voyeurism for people who feel that listening to the stories is enough to know the plight. Um, and so I'm curious how like in the narrative structure or in what you, you choose to include um, and how you frame it, how you kind of create that um, sense in the listener that they kind of have to do something after this. Right, right. Uh, in the men's series, we haven't done as much of that yet. We'll get to it sort of at the end. But in Seeing White, my my collaborator Chenjerai Kumanyika, who who is a who is an activist as well as a, a scholar and a and a journalist and so on, uh, he hit on that again and again, and we we said it very explicitly multiple times at the end. So that like there was a moment where, for example. There was a, an episode in that series uh, called Danger, and it was it was sort of it was about violence and about the hundreds of years of white folks kind of hammering away at this image of black men as dangerous, violent people, right? And um, and 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 we turn it into a discussion of it. Well, like I suggested, what if we look at the history of white on black violence? which is a phrase we don't hear very often, right? And how, if you look, if you, if you imagine a scale of uh, the black people killed by white people over hundreds of years on one side and the reverse on the other side, how grotesquely out of balance that would be in a society that's constantly saying black men are the scary ones, right? So we talked about that, and then I said this kind of heartfelt thing about, um, about you know understanding it at, through this period of the police shootings of unarmed black men, and have realizing, for example, that that my 19-year-old son would not have died in the Michael Brown case, no matter what he did, right? And I'm saying this thing that I feel like is this sort of cathartic thing that I'm trying to trying to imagine and try to understand that gulf 
And as much as, you know, Ginger, I kind of said, it's very nice. But what are you going to do about it? You know, like, it wouldn't take all that many white people really determined to speak up and change this so-called, you know, criminal justice system. We have this deeply racialized criminal injustice system. So, so, and then at the end, we said very explicitly, uh, I think I said something like, that what I had come to learn was that if um, all it take, all it would take for the, for our white supremacist society to perpetuate itself for a few more generations is for people like me, us non-racist people, to just go about our lives being good non-racists, right? Because it's it's systemic and it's self-perpetuating. It runs on its own. So there were things like that where we just tried to be really explicit about it. And in fact, in the last episode, like I'm sort of interviewing gender, I like as an activist, what should people do? And we don't have, you know, we don't, we don't it's not like, okay, here's our program, we're gonna start with, and here's the three things that you should do. But to try to get people, and that's what I feel like with this kind of work, is if, um, is that if we could move, you know, X thousand white people from being sort of like content non-racists into thinking, okay, I actually have to get involved somehow. Maybe that helps. Maybe, maybe that helps. Thank you, and thank you for dealing with this mystery, Mike.